Thank you very much for being here. What I would really like is to actually borrow your brain and borrow your time after that. And so I know that I haven't deserved anything yet. But this thing for me is important because as change agents, we tend to be put in a situation where we're in danger. And uh, a good change agent is a change agent who is alive with his job and can bring the change. And some of us, including me, have a tendency not to keep the job, um, to bring the change. So that's what th this is about. So why? I'm asking a couple of whys. The first one, I may make friends, uh, is why the fuck McKinsey keep failing Agile? <laughs> yep. Yep, yep, yep. But actually, be careful because I'm going to talk about you just after. Why do you keep having the same argument with your wife or with your husband? And why, on the other hand, um, some surfers from Hawaii who were 14 or 15 year olds suddenly all became world champions because they invented a new type of surfing that included aerials, which means jumping off waves, twisting when you were not tied to the surf. Why did mixed martial arts suddenly uh, dominated the fighting arena versus the traditional martial arts? And the response is range. Because certain people have the ability to become more, to be more, to manifest a higher potential. And the thing is, we are, as you heard, what we do repeatedly. So certain people have the capacity to do more, to do things, tomorrow that they wouldn't have done yesterday. So they gain in versatility, they gain in capability, they gain in a range of the kind of things that they can do and how they do it. And the thing is, we can only work on the things we see, we can only improve the things we see. So these people gain or usually have an ability to see things that others don't see. And actually, I want to add the word sense because even the word see is limiting. So they will see on different frames, they will see on different wavelengths, they will see things at the small scale or at the big scale. And that gives them range, that gives them an expense, that gives them the possibility to pick among all the things they can choose, the one they feel is going to be useful. And so the thing is, there is a tension, as I shared, in the work that we do. There is a tension because you can be a coach who is at work and who says, fuck, this Land Rover Jaguar project really sucks. Um, but you stay there because you're being paid or you actually try to move the, um, the, the donkey, but actually you lose your job doing so. And I love to bring change, but I have to admit, I love my wife more. And so that's really what this is about. What's in it for me in exploring this is that I want to bring change without losing my job. That's really what it is. And that requires more possibilities than what I had at the beginning. That requires a certain elegance. What's in it for you? If you're an expert, that kind of talk can enable you to work with other experts, experts you don't understand, let's say um, PMI, PGMP certified program manager, uh, McKinsey consultant, um, a CFO, people who have their own lingo, their own perception of the world, their own needs and constraints, and to bring your expertise, whether they don't understand you or you don't understand them. If you work more in orchestration, which means to, to help like a conductor, uh, help other people um, do their work so that it brings something that is a non-negotiable. You need to have this. And if you're a human, well, what you could do is actually have less fights with your partner or, let's be creative, new type of fights with your partner. <laughs> so let's put this out of the way. This is not a success story. Good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. You know this. So I've made mistakes at AirAsia. I've made mistakes at Cathay Pacific, where I was in both cases an executive. Uh, before that, I, did, I made mistakes at, with Singapore government and Hewlett Packard, where I was an advisor. Um, my great guy who actually, when I was out of money, paid me from his bank account so, because HP was too slow to pay me. Uh, and, um, and I make mistakes as a coach now in Europe because it's easier to find a coach job than a chief transformation officer working with a private equity. 
So um, now, what have you learned to see you? Well, the thing is, the people we work with, they tend to have a certain way of seeing things. If you look at finance, they will see things in, in black and red, and you can add some green because now we're Gen Y or whatever. Um, if you look in operations, they will uh, speak in cycle times, and lead times, in value streams, in flows. If you speak with HR people, they will speak about flat organization, which means that you can put the whole organization in an A0 format. Um, and they will speak about uh, influences and uh, layers and ranks. Uh, if you speak with coaches, they will speak about conversations and uh, confidence and connection. Um, and if you speak about, um, about uh, <laughs> transformers, now I, you haven't seen the big part. This three months agile transformation roadmap, it's 100% editable, you can make it three weeks. So I can actually send you the template if you want. Uh, so at least you got something from this talk. Can we say cheers? cheers. Yay! OK. So the thing is actually all these things create walls. And they create walls that have two characteristics. I'm going to speak about the, the first one is that it hurts. Because we don't see what's on the other side. And at times we think we understand, but we don't. And we don't because of different beliefs, different biases, different um, uh, blind spots that we have. And so what do we tend to see? Let's explore that. What do you see? First thing you see, please tell me, what do you see right here? My wife. Sorry? <laughs> My wife. No, 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 actually she's Malaysian. Previous one was um, Singaporean and previous one was French. Uh, <laughs> there is no after. Uh, so, so what do you see? Fish. A lady. Fish, anything else? We're good? Water, yes, great. OK, you killed my effect, but that's good. Um, so here, the same thing. We could see the small things, but you could miss the water. Thank you very much. What else do you see? Yes. Do you see the seafloor? Do you see the atmosphere behind the, uh, below, beyond the edge, which is the surface? We tend to miss these big things. We tend to see the small things, the things that are our scale, but we miss the big things. And we tend to not see the water in the sea. And the thing is yet, this water is actually filtering everything we see. So that's the problem. Transparency, contrary to what is said in Scrum and Agile, where transparency is good, when you have interactions with other people, Transparency is dangerous. And that's a great example. That's why I use this word, because this is the same word. And in one context, it's great. In the other one, it's terrible. Transparency is really bad. And you think about this, because it leads to breakdowns. It leads to breakdowns where you don't see the thing, but it's still there. And so you are going to hurt yourself. And breakdowns, they hurt, but they lead to distinctions. Distinctions usually come in two ways. It's going to be a bruise, and it's going to be clarity, like, oh, that thing, I shouldn't. And so the thing is, when you end up with this, you realize that you need better instruments. And so this is, for instance, the same galaxy, Centauro A. I'm not going to fake I knew this one before. But the thing is, when you look at it from different uh, instruments, you see vastly different things vastly different aspects of the same thing. And here again, these are the Mystic Mountains, uh, and this one I knew. And you see different things when you see, your, uh, see it in uh, radio wave and when you see it on the visible spectrum. So what you need is think about it as a camera or as a rack of instruments that will do, uh, cover the auditory spectrum, the ultraviolet, the infrared, the radio waves, the sounds, etc. How do you increase your instrumentation so that you can see more things. And as well as seeing more things, how do you as an observer decide deliberately what you see? Uh, I don't know if anybody knows Amaranato Robe. He's a coach. He used to be um, a, a Zen monk, a Buddhist monk. And he has this expression, which is, your attention is getting you away from your awareness, because there is a balance. Either you focus or you see the whole thing. And that's up to you to decide if you want to practice. Otherwise, 
the situation will govern for you. So what do you see? Do you see the individual journeys? Do you see the ecosystem? Do you see the map or do you see the territory? Is the map accurate? Do you see the biased view? Like this is an old, uh, well, I mean, given the alphabet, this is an old Greek um, map. And this is actually relatively accurate, um, but this is only showing the Mediterranean Sea. Do you see what is happening or do you see what is not happening? I remember this movie where suddenly uh, the ranger is saying, do you hear? No bird is singing. And so that's the thing. What do you notice? And what do you choose to notice? What do you have the range to choose to notice? Do you see what is waning, what is ending, what is growing? What could be? What is getting in the way? And for people, I couldn't pick the right picture, um, what is getting in the way is fear or anger or sadness. Fear is usually fear of the future, um, anger is usually anger at the present, and sadness is at the past. Uh, but it's usually getting in the way of conversations. And because we live in social settings, people usually can say, hey, I'm really afraid of losing my job, so I'm not going to tell you what you're asking me now. So there is a big interest in identifying our beliefs, uh, our biases, and our blind spots. So I work with a bunch of people called the Open Field Institute that has nothing to do with Agile, um, and, and other communities. And in, in this one, we were looking at what were the beliefs we were basing our, our work upon. And we verbalized them so that we could understand what are our differences. The point is not to align. The point is to understand the range so that we are conscious of the challenges that we could have along the way. And we could do the same about biases. I will just speak about two, which is the bias of recency and the bias of habituation. Um, you suddenly have a big fallout with an executive, suddenly you have another meeting, you will be very cautious. You could have a great meeting, but you will be cautious. Sorry? Oh, okay. Um, so, same with blind spots. We tend to have blind spots, but the thing is we don't know which ones because they're blind spots. And so, how do we, how do we address them? How do we become aware of these? So to see what you couldn't see, basically you need to focus on your instruments. You need to get more instruments. You need to get more questions. And you need to focus on awareness. Uh, uh, you need to balance focus on awareness. So we need to find new instruments, wonder, ask great questions, and then take in information, but choose how you take it in. So there are plenty of ways to see better. You could see like plenty of other ways to say the glass is half full, or you could see that the bed could actually be a trampolino for, uh, uh, for kids. This one is actually funny. I was in Netherlands for a year and a half, um, and um, at some point we were doing a reverse logistics super hub. Basically, we take some broken shit and we repair it and send it back. And so some people, smart guys, said, hey, it's very easy, the process. You, you scan the barcode and you're done. Yeah, the dummy had forgotten that the, the company, Nortel, had grown through acquisition for 20 years. So they had acquired plenty of companies who had, oh, miracle, not agreed ahead of time to use the same barcode system. So of course, that ended up in a train wreck. Um, another thing, I was working with an insurance company in Indonesia, and they were speaking about doing radio conferencing and so on, and they, they tended to forget that people in Indonesia in certain places had um, 128 ki kilobit per second uh, connection, so that won't work really well. Uh, you could look at the details, you could look at the big picture. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this comes from the Presencing Institute, which is learning different ways. Usually, we do downloading. We try to look at, we receive only the things we know and you say, and we say, oh yeah, yep, yep, I like this guy, or I like this lady. There are other ways to listen. You can actually take the facts as they are, notice them without judging. You can also have empathy, which means seeing through the eyes of another. So understanding the perspective of an executive. That's what Wilbert shared with us yesterday. Um, you can also have generative conversation, these kind of conversations where you get in flow and you, know, you pause at times, but you're not going to be interrupted and suddenly you create something that you didn't think possible. So that's the kind of listening that we're speaking about. And we will not um, have a decision on whether one of the two is right. Um, the key point is seeing changes everything. But then we have to do something. 
So what have we learned to do? What are the disciplines you've learned? Maybe you're a coach, maybe you've learned Scrum or Lean or Lean from the industry or Kanban. Um, maybe you've learned to be an executive coach, maybe you're a psychologist, maybe you learned finance. All these disciplines are going to be opening different ways of understanding things, but also new ways to address things. One of my favorite series of books that comes in all shapes and all publishers is Think Like or Act Like a Mathematician, an Astronomer, Anything You Want. Um, these next two years, I'm with psychologists and psychotherapists, um, not as a client, as a working with them. Um, the, the other thing is, what is your contribution? What do you bring when you come? Do you bring your knowledge? And that's where it stops. Do you bring your know-how and you actually show people how? Do you actually do it for them? Do you actually um, look at the situation and you give a report and you stop? Or do you report and then you act when you've been given um, uh, the authorization? Or do you actually are so trusted that you actually act and then you report how it went? These are vastly different contributions. And people could have different ones as well. What's your style also? Are you an asshole? Um, I used to be, at least uh, some people said, and they were probably right because I really liked what I was thinking. And when you're in love with what you're thinking, usually it's not a good sign. Or in the contrary, are you too subservient? I don't understand why you guys have difficulties talking to executives. I became an executive in two meetings. I was hired at AirAsia to become head of digitalization. I did my work. Then the chief of staff had me meet the CEO. We got on his jet and I was the chief transformation officer. That was it. And the thing is, when you meet with them, whether you're a coach now, I'm at a large consulting firm, a grouping of consulting firms, and they had been waiting for nine months to talk to the CFO. I'm working on an initiative, I was working with, on an initiative, which is why this talk, uh, called Future of Finance. And when I asked the team who is the client, they said, um, corporate information system, and I said, well, that's called Future of Finance. I think the CFO would like to know. And indeed, as soon as I talked with him, we had like a one and a half hour conversation that was not planned, and they asked for a conversation the week after and to make it recurrent. So what is the style and what are the barriers that are self-imposed? So do what you wouldn't have done the day before. Touch new disciplines, T discuss with people you, you know do things differently. Actually, be interested in the opinions of people who are really different. If you can pick one thing, imagine a person you don't like or you don't connect with. Learn from that person. Learn from that person. Don't listen to them thinking, you fucker, I'm going to make you wrong. <laughs> no, listen as in, what am I missing? What am I missing? and then do that. And that opens new possibilities. So we're going to go fast on that. Who have you learned to be? You probably have labels attached to your name or to your back, and you don't know, but you have labels. And they will say, oh, um, Frederick is nice. Not a lot of people would say that, but um, um, anything. And then you could choose to be so much more. If you're comforting, you could become slightly challenging. You could become reassuring. How do you get so many labels that at some point people forget the labels because they know that no matter what the situation, you will say, not this time, buddy. I'll be what is needed in the room. And so that takes practice because then you have this range. So the point is to be what is needed, what is wanted, what is missing in the room not what your ego naturally would have done. There are four ways to do the work. You can work on archetypes, you can work on role models, you can work on stances or metaphors. Archetypes come from C.G. Young, and it's basically um, a representation of an ideal. So for instance, the, the ruler, the king, the queen, um, the jester, the magician, the hero, the warrior. All these represent something. They represent a certain way of coming into the world. If there is a situation, the warrior will want to break it, the lover will want to embrace it and bring it in, the ruler will say, how do I contain it? And the magician would say, what kind of shit can we make explode? <laughs> um, and um, the, the other thing is role models. What are your role models? And what can you 
if you have a role model, it's probably because they represent something you wish you could be. So why not be that? Um, what stances and posture? When you come to an executive, do you say hello as peers because we're both human beings and we both have contributions? Or do you say, what can I do for you? Um, metaphors, thinking about water. Um, be like water, my friend. Uh, the water, put it in the cup and it becomes the cup. Put it in a bottle, it becomes the bottle. But there are other ways, other qualities of water. It seeps into the rock and, and breaks them. Uh, it holds a boat, but it seeps through the finger. Metaphors are great ways to think about usefulness. Be of use, which is a great poem, by the way. Check it, be of use. Really inspiring. The thing is, all these things are way to dabble but can you actually manifest it? Can you bring it to the room when it's needed? Can you be that? So all of this is about being present. And being present really means two things. If you go into the self-help and um, a new age section, it's going to be about taking in things, being in the room, being there, present, to what is happening. And if you go to the executive section, it's how can everyone see you? But the thing is, it's actually both at the same time. That's the, one of the topics where I agree that non-duality is a good thing. I mean, du duality is a, yeah, I mean, I don't know how to say it. I mean, basically you can be both and that's it. Uh, so take it in and bring it out. And the thing is, even the word presence it tends to be limiting because it tends to say, be present to what is. But if you want to be, be a change agent and you're present to what is and that's it, what change are you going to bring? You need to, present, to be present also to what they could be, to what they don't want to be, to what they're afraid to be, to what they would be next. And all this is the room that you walk in. That's the potential, the range you have and you're free roaming. And so, that comes to, yes, I'm not going to be, uh, to be late. Um, so the first thing is you can expand. You can expand what you see. You can expand what you do, what you can. Actually, it's really important. It's not because you can that you will, but if you can, you will have the choice. So you can expand what you can see. You can expand what you can do. And so you can expand what you can be. The path is always the same. Fall, cry, and, oh no, that's not this one. <laughs> Become aware of distinctions, find the work you need in that, and then do the work. Now, that is not new, that's just a different way to say second order learning. But it is second order, order learning applied to being a change agent. Uh, anybody really not familiar with this? I can explain it in one minute. Okay, second order learning. The traditional way is I do something, it doesn't work, I try something else, but among the things I have, and at some point I run out of options. That's first order learning. Second order learning is I try something, it doesn't work, I try something else, it doesn't work. I think, I step back, I look and I say, how else could I see this thing? So for instance, I realized that my wife really wants a winner, not a whiner. So as soon as I'm sad, if I say, I need help, can I get a hug? There is no chance I get a hug. So I need to see her as somebody who is making me grow, not somebody who doesn't love me. And when I see that, I think, oh, wow, I'm so lucky. And as soon as I manifest being strong but saying, it's tough today, then I get my hug. That's second order learning. Does it make sense? Cool. Um, so it's going to hurt. That is going to hurt. So it needs to be a deliberate choice. And it's not going to hurt one time. It hurts. Every day you try it. It hurts because when you hit the door, uh, usually you hit the door on the way out, if you tried to do and you were not elegant, and that hurts. That hurts physically, emotionally, etc. But beyond the breakdown and the bruises, it also hurts because the distinctions create cognitive load and emotional load. Because you used to understand the world a certain way, 
And now you have to reconsider this. And frankly, I don't have the energy to do this every day. But it also hurts through the grind. It's exhausting to actually try something and never be in your comfort zone in the area you mastered. Try that other thing and you're not a master again. So this real, really hurt, which is why festina lente, hurry slowly. Don't try to take it everything, uh, to take everything at the same time. Just go relatively slowly, pick a thing, try it, fail in a safe um, place and then move. So how can you do that? You practice a lot. Um, for the instruments, we saw that before. Get new instruments, get new questions, and balance what you look at. For doing what you wouldn't, expose yourself. Go and talk to psychologists, to mathematicians, to accountants. I heard bad things about accountants. Accountants are great. You just need to know what they're great at. Um, explore new fields, and then experiment. So put your thing in the water, Two minutes is great. Um, try to go in the water and then try to swim on the back. Um, working with archetypes, role models, postures, metaphors, you can buy great books. Um, King, warrior, magician, lover is a really good, simple model with only four archetypes. Um, wow, I realize I actually say it like Asians. Um, you can also play with um, the archetypes from Carolyn Miss, which enables you to have cards and play with it. You can look at um, biographies and you can play with postures like method acting is a great way. Uh, and you can play with metaphors by simply looking at something in your room and thinking uh, in, in your apartment and saying, hey, I'm like a plunger. What does this mean? Um, and play and make it safe. There are places where it's really not safe to play. I've done it. I've been removed from teams and actually sold $50 million deals by receiving calls from the client at my home because my boss didn't want me to talk to them. Um, grow a pair, and I mean it, and it's because I'm French and I don't know it's a pun. Um, what I mean by that is you will need to catch your courage. You will need to, because it's scary. But also, don't do this alone. Get strength in number, because when you have actually a real climbing rope, the picture I showed you at the beginning, it's a lie, it doesn't break this way. Um, so find strength in numbers. And remember who you are. Because if you try to be everything, you could actually end up not liking yourself. Don't do that. Know who you are and just understand it's the play. We're actually so close from the, the globe from Shakespeare, right? The world is a stage. And uh, I just made a mistake and it's okay. Um, so remember, good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. So you will fail. So make mistakes and just let it go. Your turn. <laughs> Do we have time for questions or? Okay, if there are questions. Well, it's, it's actually a little example rather than a question, but it illustrates some Please. things uh, like pairing and being someone different and, and all the rest of it. I was, um, I was in a consulting engagement in South Africa, and it was me, the Brit, the Kanban guy, working with a Canadian scrum guy. Very different styles, but we settled into a really great working relationship. And as soon as it settled into a great, comfortable relationship, we said, well, how do we mix it up? And uh, I was him for a day, and he was me for a day. And not just in terms of scrum and Kanban, but in terms of style, how we facilitated what we did. And our self-awareness was dialed up like 10 times. It's a, it was a brilliant learning experience. So if you ever get the opportunity to try something like that, it, it was great fun. Thank you. Uh, actually, my wife and I, on the days when we're not having real arguments, we have fake arguments. <laughs> so what I mean by that is she will literally, um, I will play her. And she will play me. So she, uh, she will say, oh, I would like a hug. And I will say, no, go away. I need space, or things like that. And that enables us, actually, realizing how we come across. So we, we are not getting paid for that, but it's good fun. <laughs> so um, anything else? It doesn't need to be a question. I don't have. I was just going to ask, on the topic of safety, do you really believe in safety? 
Do I really believe in safety? Couple of things in this. Uh, I like the notion of uh, brave space from uh, Jed, Jed? Uh, there is a uh, scrum master here. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah. Uh, but I believe in safety for others. Um, I don't know if you saw this in LinkedIn, but the alligator thing, like the, uh, I, I don't think I'm the victim. Uh, on that note, have you seen Fred Kaufman presentation, your job is not your job? Okay, go to Google, write this down. You, you can forget me, but don't forget this one. Your job is not your job. Three videos. The thing is, end of the third video, I'm a player. I'm not on the seats. I'm not a bench warmer. I'm a player. If I get hurt, it's fine. That's the life I want. So I don't believe in safety for me. And that shows. Um, but I believe that as an executive and as a change agent, you need to keep it. I'll give you an example. When I was a sales guy at Oracle, um, we were dealing with Procter & Gamble, and they were, we were presenting something that was new in terms of collaboration, AI forecasting, and knowledge management. And they were asking us the same question again and again and again. Have you done it before? And the sales guys would wiggle away. I raised my hand, and that's why I ended up off the team. And I said, you know, when JFK launched the space program, he didn't say, have you all done it before? He said, can you send a man in space? And if he comes back, can you catch him? So what I can tell you is two things. I can tell you we've done all the pieces, but we've not done the integration. And all of us here don't want to see on the first page of the New York Times, um, Procter & Gamble is suing um, Oracle for not delivering on their promise. After that, the CIO, Filippo Pazzarini, and the chief architect asked for my number, and my boss removed me from the contact with the team. So safety, I think, as an executive, you need to think about the safety. Now, I'm not telling you that to say my team was idiots. I'm telling you that, look at it differently. It took me 10 years to see it that way. I was an asshole <laughs> because I actually said the right thing, but I didn't think about the safety of my team. So I was doing the right thing for the client, but not for my team. So you need to think, if you have the ability to zoom out, see the room, it's your responsibility and it's expected, it's table stakes, that you will think about the safety of everyone. That's why I like one-to-one -one conversations, because they suddenly say things they wouldn't say otherwise. Even executives, in particular executives. Does this address your question? Anything else? So knowing what you know now, what would I apologize. So knowing what you know now, what would you do differently in highlighting those issues for the client and making it safe if you were still going to take action? How I would address that situation? I would take another lens than the one I had taken, and it's actually not even looking at space. So it's not about zooming in, zooming out, etc. I would have looked at time. Because I had been in the company for a good year at the time. So I would have known that people would wiggle. And I would have known because I had enough conversation with, um, with um, uh, Procter & Gamble that it would happen. So I would have looked at time and I would have followed the advice of a senior manager of mine, first year of consulting at KPMG, um, who said, you never win a meeting in the meeting. You win a meeting before the meeting by choosing who to invite and preparing them. And you win the meeting after the meeting by writing the minutes. And so what I would have done is I would have prepared the other people to say, we haven't done it, but tech. they would have shown. And that's, uh, have you read, um, I'm going to do a shameless plug. Have you read um, uh, uh, Purpose Driven People? Okay, so that's part of the two books I contributed to. And if you look at chapter nine, one of them is make people shine, don't shine. When you're an executive, that's what, that was actually what became the hardest for me. Because I used to be smart, and as an executive, you cannot shine. Because if you shine, you remove it from everyone else. So you need to consider what are the things you cannot do anymore. And intervening in a meeting is a no-no if you're an enabler. Because it's the time for the others. The moments where you can shine are when you prepare people one-on-one, -on -one and when you debrief. And they'll be grateful. Does it make sense?
No? Yeah? Cool. So I would have looked at time and not, may, and not shiny. Anything else? Cool. Go enjoy your coffee. Yay! Yay.